Hello, and welcome to part 13 of a series where I am building a protogen head. In the last episode, we attempted to use DMA to drive the spy bus for the internal status display, and although the software looked like it was sending the data correctly, we weren't able to see anything on the display. In this part, I'm going to hook up my logic analyzer and debug why it isn't working. Okay, so I got my logic analyzer out. Uh, I'm going to have to turn off the head or the microcontroller so I can remove the display because that's really the only way I can get to all of the signals that I need to analyze easily. I need to sample at, actually, what is the frequency that I am using on here? It's set 10 megahertz. That is super fast. I am going to slow it down to one megahertz, which shouldn't cause a problem. It just means that I only need to sample here at, we'll call it four megahertz, and we'll take 10 million samples. Well, we don't even need 10 million samples. We'll take five million samples, so we'll get about a second and a quarter's worth of data. And I want to, is it this icon? Yes, I want to disable the last three channels because I don't need them. I want to name D0 to be data, D1 to be clock, D2 to be DC, D3 to be wrist, and D4 to be CS. And then ideally I could add a filter onto the, a pro, yeah, protocol decoder, call it, look for spy, add spy, boom, come over here. Clock is from clock, chip select is from chip select. It can just recognize those names, I guess, which is cool. And then master out slave in is data. If I go ahead and reflash it to slow it down. And then once that is done, then I can, okay. I don't need this. I can come over here. I can get ready to hit the run button as soon as I hit the reset button in here. So if I hit reset run, I don't see anything. Does this have a delay after the reset? This might have a delay after the reset. It's the delays for one second after the reset. Okay. Uh, and let's gather 10 million samples. So if I hit reset and then wait for about one second before I hit run. So reset, run. There we go. So we got something. Data and clock, so we get something. Chip select is just always low. So all this stuff over here is just always low. It's literally always low. Hmm. That's not right. But the, sp the screen was working before I switched it to the DMA version of this code. So we know that those pins are in fact correct. Now let's just zoom in here. Whoop. Zoom in here and see what we actually have. So we have an A, a D5, and what are we actually doing when we reset it? Oh uh, God, no, it's, no, it is this. It's, it's this file. So this is trying to do a display off, which is an AE. So we have an AE, and then we have a D5, D5. But see, shouldn't this all be coming in as is command? So this is coming in here as is command true. See, it should be setting CS pin to high, and CS pin is never going high. Why is CS never going high? Regardless, you know, it looks like it's initializing correctly. I don't want to step through every single thing it's doing, but what's the lat display on? We should be getting an AF here somewhere. AF, so display on. So now it's basically saying, okay, I'm done initializing. So that's, so this first burst of activity is just the 
setting everything up. And that looks like it worked just fine. And we come over here where we are presumably sending it a frame of data. And this is all going to be zeros because we know that from the first from the previous output that we are getting a bunch of zero frames. So this one's also zeros, but then it looks like we're sending pixel data. It just looks like we're never setting chip select to high or data command to high. What did I do wrong? I never, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Let's reflash with the correct code. Wait for it to boot. Come on in here. Hit the reset button, take a new capture. Notice that, hey, look at that, chip select, data command, reset, are all doing a thing now. Face palm again. Unplug it from power. Unplug the logic analyzer, plug the screen in. Plug it in the power. Lo and behold, it's working. <laughs> uh, well, I probably didn't need the logic analyzer if I would have looked at the code some more, but hey, you know, the logic analyzer made me realize that why are these bits, why are these pins never getting flipped? And then when it looked into it and figured out why they weren't getting flipped and lo and behold, we have the screen updating just fine. So this is good. I don't need the logic analyzer anymore. I don't need to save that. Now it gets a little bit more complicated when we come over here and we want to take those changes that we did in the experimental program and put them into the real program because we're already using DMA in the real program and we have to make it work with other DMA. But the good news is we are allocating memory already for two DMA descriptors, but we're only using one. So hopefully it's just a simple matter of saying, hey, yeah, let's use the other one. So let's find out non-DMA spy. So now we want a DMA spy. And that means we just go yoink, do that. We don't need this, but we need to give it DMA descriptor zero and DMA channel zero. Well, actually this is This is all the same, actually. And I also do need to have Right here, I need a OLED int interrupt.new sam.irq circom zero one OLED. OLED DMA int which doesn't exist yet. It will be 
DNA int Do I not have interrupt? Where is the other interrupt set? Oh, those are just set. Eh, but these ones can't be because it needs to... Uh... Well, that's fine. I don't know why I have to have that in retrospect. I don't remember why I added that, but it's fine. And I think that's it? Is it that simple? Let's find out. It takes a lot, of, a lot longer to compile, which is why I was using the Scratch program. Uh, don't think that's a good sign. I don't know what it's doing right now. It's just stuck. However, we can see that it Got some interrupts, so it was able to send multiple buffers, multiple screens. Like we see, because uh, we still have our debug login here, we have all the commands here, and we have two frame, two screens of blank, and then three screens of data with more and more data on them. Uh, you can quite clearly tell where the inverse video is here. These are, this is just the inverse video here at the top with the solid lines of pixels. So we got three frames of data, but we never got a TX complete after the last one, which is why it's stuck. It is stuck waiting to be able to draw the next line of text. And because it never got the TX complete interrupt, that will not ever unstick. So why is it stuck? Hmm. But when we see the data printed here that we have already flagged the trans the trend the transmission is starting. And then we say this is what we're sending, and then we start sending it. So we see that, but we never see a TX complete. So why are we never getting a TX complete? Let's just see if it always gets stuck at the exact same place. It looks like it does. So why is the, so we get one, two, three, four, five interrupts, but the scratch program also doesn't try to just hammer stuff out to it. However, it's not running two DMAs at once. Actually, wait, am I, am I being stupid? Is this stuff using the, I'm being stupid. I'm using Okay, that'll do it. I thought I needed to switch this one to use zero, but the other one is using zero, so I need this one to use one. And that is probably... I thought I was being smart by switching that, but I think I was being dumb. Because it's getting to the point where it's trying to initialize the LEDs on top of the same DMA channel. But I thought I was already using, or still using one on that, not zero, so... That's a my bad. I just wasted some time. Hey, there we go. Look at that. Bada bing, bada boom. Let's go ahead and clear that off. And we are running at 45 frames per second. That's two or three frames per second faster than we were before. Well, shit. <laughs> I guess the majority of the time on this is spent 
on updating the frame buffer and not actually sending the data to the device. I'm not using the optimizer. Let's see if the optimizer helps. I was hoping this would make a much bigger difference than it did. I'm not, I mean, I'm glad I did it. I've been wanting to do it, but I was just hoping for a bigger difference. Well, this is gonna take even longer to compile because it's running more passes of the optimizer. There we go. Uh, that, was, that alarm was reminding me I need to restart my camera here in less than two minutes. Okay. Okay, the optimizer helps. Now it's running at 64, 63, 64 frames per second. That's more where I want. So just, also I still have my debug code in there. That's probably causing a bunch of problems too. So let's, since it is now working, let's get rid of all of these debug lines. Well, not all of them, there's only a couple of them, but let's get rid of these debug lines in here because that's not insignificant. So let's go ahead and try doing it again with the optimizer. So the target to beat now is about 65 frames per second. Uh, this is with the optimizer, but it's still outputting debug messages every single time it gets an interrupt and every single time it starts sending data. So that is going to be slow by a lot. So hopefully this will get us an improvement. And if it does, then I'll try it again with the optimizer back on default, which is compilation speed slash size as opposed to speed, I believe. Well, okay, 75, 71, 70, when I'm talking 70-ish. So let's try it now without having, without specifying the optimizer. And if, I, I hope this will get us close to 60. This will probably be mid to upper 50s. But let's just see what happens. And I'm just gonna force it into the bootloader because it's just not been reliable tonight. Uh, 50 hertz. 51, so I gained nine frames per second by doing this, which not as big of an increase as I would have liked or expected, but respectable nonetheless. And this that's without using the, the optimizer. If I use the optimizer, it's much better. And I wonder, you know, how fast can I crank it? Like, what's the, the speed limit on this? for the uh, frequency, you know? It, like, what is what does this display support? And does it specify? This doesn't specify its maximum operating frequency. So let's just see what we can do. Let's just see what happens at 20. Does it still work? I don't know. We'll find out together. There we go. Send the experiment program back over. While that is loading, I will try to reattach this. But if it runs, if it's fine at 20, then fuck it. Let's just, let's send it. Just fucking send it, you know? Then this is where I'm going to wrap it up for the night. We'll see if sending it to 20 makes it go any better. But if not, I am content with this. I will go through and clean up the, well... Clean up the code a little bit, but make sure it's committed and saved and just happy. And then I can get rid of the old code and then move on with my life. No, it's still about 50 hertz. That, that makes sense. It doesn't, it would make sense that there's very little data that actually gets transmitted for each frame here. So even when it was happening synchronously, it wasn't using up that much of the time. So the majority of the time right now is actually computing what this needs to be, which is Okay, a little bit annoying. But anyway, that's all I have for this part of the series. Uh, next time, which again, will probably be two or three weeks. I'm just not having as much time or motivation to work on this right now since there's no uh, near proximate event that I will want to have it for. But in the next two or three weeks, I will probably in some off time work on trying to figure out how I want to like mount the rest of the stuff to the head. Um, Cause I don't want to permanently attach everything to this because that just makes it difficult to clean. Uh, I had at some point a while ago, like tried to make a little test fit of a 
a frame to go on here to see to you know just have stuff slide on so that it mostly fits but some of the angles aren't quite right and like there's a big gap here at the top but not here at the side and this doesn't match up with this is so like if I can try to improve upon this to make this whole concept work better I'm going to want to try to do that and I just want to have a way to attach the stuff that's going to be here, you know, in a, in a semi-permanent manner that doesn't involve just gluing everything straight to this because that makes it very difficult to clean. Especially when you consider that all of this stuff in here would have to come out first, which would then mean going in with a screwdriver like this or up from underneath and it, that would just be annoying at best. And I still need to finalize the frame here. Uh, I guess since this is the first video since I've done the last thing, I did print out a new copy of the frame, which is close. This mount is good enough. So like the board is actually screwed in at this corner, but the bottom corner was off by like a millimeter diagonally. So it didn't quite line up. So I just need to move that. And I'm probably gonna give up on the other two up here because one blocks a screw to the actual LED panel and the other one is just, I don't think it's needed. I think it'll just be secured by the, the pin connector to the LED and then these two little standoffs. And I'll have the other ones just there for support for pushing stuff in, but it won't be screwed into it. So hopefully two or three weeks, I'll have an update of something related to finishing this up. There's obviously still stuff to do with the software because you know, this needs moved over, this needs moved over and made narrower. So I don't know when I'm gonna get around to doing that stuff, but I need to at least start figuring out what I'm gonna be doing with attaching the rest of the stuff to this head. But in the meantime, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you did, subscribe for more, uh, comment, like, you know, you know the whole drill by now. But uh, thanks for watching.